Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, rather. And uh, uh, to those of you who are present here today and those of you who are following us beyond the screen rather than behind the screen, and welcome to this new event uh, organized by the Observatorio de la Lengua Española y las Culturas Hispánicas in Los Estados Unidos. I am really happy to welcome here Professor Philip Carson, whom I read, but I actually heard through an interview on NPR last June, in which he was discussing an article which he recently published about a new variety of English um, that, can be, that he identified or that can be identified in Miami because of the influence uh, from Spanish. I thought, when I heard the interview, this interview on the radio, I thought the findings and of his research were so interesting and so exciting that I immediately con contacted him in order to invite him to give a talk here on this fascinating and, to my view, innovative and, and very relevant topic for our purposes. So here he is. And uh, let me briefly introduce to you Professor uh, uh, Philip Carter, who is Associate Professor of English and Linguistics in the Department of English and Director of the Center for the Humanities in, in an Urban Environment at Florida International University. He has a PhD from Duke University, and he has specialized in social linguistics as, as well as in language and culture in US Latino communities. In his research, Professor Carter uses concepts and, and, and data from various disciplines, such as social linguistics, linguistic anthropology, critical discourse analysis, ethnography, ethnography and critical theory. And he has addressed a large uh, range of issues, for example, like uh, social, the relationship between social formations and linguistic variation, Spanish language change in the US, maintenance and shift of Spanish in the US, language contact and bilingualism, dialect formation, language and politics, and popular discourses about language. So more specifically, for example, he, in his research projects, he has examined the dialectic um, uh, between national narratives about immigration and the individual in his or her circumstances. And in his publications, he's dealt with, for example, the context of identity formation among Mexican, Mexican immigrant children in North Carolina, or the implicit and explicit perceptions of Spanish and English among Latino and non-Latino residents in Miami. He's, pub he's published numerous articles on these topics uh, uh, in leading international journals like jour the Journal of Social Linguistics or the English World, English Worldwide, etc. And uh, a few years ago, he co-authored a book with uh, Julie Tettel Anderson uh, titled "Languages in the World: How History, Culture, and Politics Shape Language," published by Blackwell Press, <laughs> in which they offer a broad look at the non-linguistic conditions affecting human language. But Professor Carter goes beyond the academic uh, context, and he has frequently disseminated his findings and, and his studies uh, through national and international media, such as Miami, the Miami Herald, uh, El Nuevo Heraldo, The New York Times, CNN, CNN en Español, etc. This article I mentioned at the beginning, which he published in collaboration with his colleague, Kristen D'Alessandro, has been widely read. Uh, he, uh, Professor Carter has been interviewed about the findings in this article, which they published in this article. He has given interviews from LA to London, the videos that he mentions in, in it, and some of which we're going to see today, have been uh, shown in TikTok uh, millions of times. So he's become the authority on, on, on the Miami dialect. So we feel really, really fortunate and honored to have you here today, Philip. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Marta. I would like to begin by expressing um, so much gratitude first to have a scholarly career to be able to do this work, especially in Florida right now, it's not easy. And I'm just really, oops. I'm just really um, 
grateful to be able to do this work and it's an honor to be able to work with the people of Miami and study language in Miami, which is, um, I hope you'll see a really fascinating situation. I wanna thank Marta, I wanna thank the Observatorio, I wanna thank Instituto Cervantes and Harvard and all of you who are here and those of you who are watching at home, I'm really uh, grateful for your attendance. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, so I want to dive in because I have a really, they, they noticed I have a really long talk. I'm going to try and keep it under an hour. I have four goals for this afternoon. Um, as you know, I'm here to talk to you about Miami, but at the broadest level, I want to tell you a story about colonialism. Sorry, we kind of have to just do that. Um, and the languages of European colonialism, and specifically about the 500 year dance taking place between the two largest language groups to colonize the Americas, namely Spanish and English. And as a part of this story, I want to home in and emphasize the findings from my research over the past decade on one of the most significant situations of language contact taking place in all of the Americas, not only the United States, but throughout the Americas, namely that of Spanish and English in Miami during the period of 1959 to the present. As a part of that subject, I want to focus on the linguistic details of the contact, especially on the ways in which Spanish is influencing the structures of English in the speech of Miami among Cubans and Cuban Americans, but also emphasize the non-linguistic conditions that make the contact situation and their linguistic consequences as their effects. So I'm gonna be talking both about the micro details of the linguistic structure of Miami English and about Spanish that influences it, but also about history and politics and identity. And these things in my view are already always bound up with one another and I hope that you will agree or be convinced. As a further part of the story, I hope to show that although some of the details of the linguistic situation are unique to South Florida, some details are not. Some of them are shared. The structures are shared with other Spanish-English bilingual communities in the United States. But finally, what I think is really special about what's going on in Miami and being able to study Miami in real time is that the situation reminds us that all of our languages, language varieties, and all of the structures of our languages and language varieties, including the words and sounds, have a history, and that that history is a human history and a political history. And then finally, I hope to offer some reflections about why this research has resonated so deeply with so many people, not only in Miami and the United States, but indeed around the world. So I'm gonna start here. I'm gonna try and move this little, you can't see it, but I'm gonna move the zoom window. I wanna start by backing way, way, way up and just looking at the place of Spanish in the United States. And this map depicts the most commonly spoken languages other than English um, with four colors. Blue is French, green is German, purple is Tagalog. And of course, it's no surprise to anyone here or watching at home that red is Spanish. And that's because we know that about one in five people in the United States, about 18% um, speak Spanish. And that's because there are about 50 million, depending on how you count it, Spanish speakers in the United States. Let's see. There we go. And it's not just a question of numbers, but also of time depth. And that's something that I wanna emphasize. Although our epistemology of language suggests and has have us believe over and over again that uh, Spanish is constructed as a foreign language or a recent language or a language of immigrants, in fact, it's been here all along. And I can remind you of that point by showing you this map. It's Mexico in 1824. And then to remind you of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, that ceded about 50% of Mexican territory to the United States. And the reason I'm showing you this uh, map and a talk about Miami is to situate Miami in the period of 1959 to the present in the long colonial history in which English and Spanish have been commingling with one another and producing unique linguistic results throughout the Americas, but especially in what we now know as the United States uh, on the same timeline. So, and to clarify that what is interesting about Miami is that it's both unique and general at the same time. Language in Miami is unique and circumstanced by the specific political developments in Cuba and elsewhere in Latin America in the latter half of the 20th century, but also very much a part of the singular story about the unfolding and playing out of linguistic consequences of European colonialism in the Americas. So I don't want to lose sight of the big picture. And then there's the Chicano line, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me, which is not a sentiment that we hear very often in Miami, but is still nevertheless a part of the story. So at this stage, I want to put the colonial narrative that we're setting up aside for just a second and say something about the linguistic traditions that inform my thinking and the work that I've conducted over the past decade 
in Miami. It's important to me as a scholar to situate my work with the people who came before me and who contextualize what I do. There are two traditions um, that I'm working in. One is the study of language variation and change animated by the fields of dialectology and quantitative sociolinguistics. And the second is the study of language contact animated again by the fields of quantitative sociolinguistics and language documentation. And I don't want to get too, too bogged down in theory, but there are four lessons that I want to take away from each of these traditions. And the first four are thus. Uh, one, the study of language variation and change teaches us that changes in linguistic structure can be studied not only historically as we look to the deep past or the recent past, but they can also be studied as they unfold in real time. And we call that the study of linguistic change and progress. Uh, something that we got really beginning in the 1960s with the field of quantitative sociolinguistics. And that's the type of work that I'm um, engaging with with my study of English in Miami. Number two, this work teaches us that although not all variation in the linguistic system leads to a inevitable change in the structures of the language, all changes proceed from variation. So if you have form A and form B, they may co-vary in perpetuity, or A may be B, or B may be A. But in any case, if one of them wins, it was because there was variation in the system. In other words, variation is the norm. There's not language without language variation, and there's not language change without language variation. Three, linguistic variation and linguistic change involve both factors related to the linguistic system as such, but also factors related to society. Language is thus already always a function and a product of the speech community. It's not an abstraction of people, places, and politics. It is of people, places, and politics. And for linguistic variation, including what we call non-standard or vernacular language forms or vernacular language varieties, dialects, or whatever you want to call them, is pattern systematic and rule govern, as is all natural human language, in spite of popular uh, constructions of dialects or non-standard dialects as being missing the mark or whatever. So then four lessons from the study of language contact. One, we know that in theory, all kinds of linguistic materials, be they lexical, sound system related, morphology, grammatical, syntax, whatever, can be transferred from one language to another in a contact situation. But we know that in practice, certain kinds of linguistic materials move more easily than others. The words, the lexicon moves more easily, say, than uh, grammatical structures. Three, we know that the most promiscuous types of transfer takes place in situations where there's widespread bilingualism in the community without diglossia. So where the languages are used in a variety of social situations, not divided like I use Spanish in the church and English at school, right? And finally, this is the most important point, and we're going to come back to it when we look at the research on uh, English in Miami. We know from this body of research that uh, linguistic outcomes of language contact situations depend really on three things. The duration of the contact, how many years this is going on for, the intensity, how close the speakers are to each other, and how much they're, they're trading their languages. And then three, the most important one really, is the extent to which the speakers are of equal or unequal social, cultural, and political standing. And to illustrate this final point, I want to give two contrastive historical examples, um, maybe of interest. One is the Norman invasion of England in 1066, and one is the Moorish conquest of Iberia in 711 which could look very similar to one another, but in fact are very different. Um, the Norman invasion, this is when French-speaking Normans came in 1066, the Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror, and all of that stuff, if you know that. And it can be said that the contact situation was intense, long-standing, and with a marked power difference between the, the uh, French-speaking aristocracy and the English-speaking plebeians, such that all this vocabulary trickled down to the English speakers, and some 10,000 words of French replaced the Germanic stock of the English language, which led to all these grammatical consequences, the loss of grammatical gender, the loss of case, and all this stuff in the history of the English language, and moved English from Old English to Modern English. The influence of French on Modern English is considered extensive. In contrast, the, the, the Los Moros were in Spain for a much longer period of time than the Normans were ruling uh, England, 700 years versus 250 years, and yet the influence of Arabic on Modern Spanish is considered minimal, because of those other uh, factors of intensity of, of contact and uh, the question of power. So with all of that in mind, I want to go to this map uh, and pick up the colonial storyline once more. And the reason I like to show this map is that it forces us to reconcile how much Miami is of the Caribbean and in the Caribbean. And it has obviously always been that way because it's geography. But even before there was the Cuban Revolution, 
And even before there was Chavismo and even before any of these other political ev events of the last half century, there, in the pre-colonial era, there were the Arawakan people who were moving around this area. And indeed, the Tequesta, who are the indigenous people of South Florida, are brethren to the Tainos, who are the indigenous people of Cuba and Puerto Rico. And so this has always been an area of cultural and linguistic movement. So then just fast forwarding to some more movements. So let's get to the, the, the part of the story where it's 1959 and it's the Castro takeover of Cuba. And so I wanna just put the political storyline embedded in the colonial storyline in line with the language contact situation, specifically that fourth point, uh, that the specific outcomes of language contact depend on the intensity of contact, the duration of contact, and the power differential between the speakers of the languages that are in contact with one another. Now, when the first wave of exiles came in 1959, 1960, and early 1960s, in the wake of the revolution, no one obviously was thinking about the linguistic outcomes of this for all kinds of reasons because there were more pressing things to deal with, number one. But number two, the idea was that the exilic situation was not permanent, right? We were going to, cuando volvamos a Cuba, like when we're, we're gonna go back, it's gonna end, we're gonna go back. But in the end, obviously, that did not happen. Um, the regime was never toppled and now the exile carries on into a sixth uh, decade. And that's enough time for ripples to be felt in the structures of the language through contact. So we have an answer already or a clue to the first part of the contact situation, uh, duration of contact. Duration of contact, we're now over half a century into this contact situation. The second uh, factor is intensity of contact, which we can only understand now in retrospect, looking back at the demographic shift that took place in the wake of the Cuban Revolution beginning uh, in the 1960s. And I just want to give you the demographic profile of Miami-Dade, what was uh, then called Dade County, in 1960. 1964% Cuban, 80% Anglo-White. I say Anglo-White to disambiguate English-speaking Anglos from Spanish-speaking or bilingual Hispanics or Latinos, 15% African-American. And watch the way the numbers increase. 1970, 24% Hispanic. 1980, 36% Hispanic. Already by 1990, about half. And then in 2000, it moves over half. And then in 2010, 65% Hispanic, uh, Miami City 79. And I didn't put the, uh, sorry, I didn't add the 2020, but 2020, Miami Dade is now over 70% 70, 70 Hispanic Latino, and Miami City is over 80%. And obviously, this stuff just owes to, <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to point it out, this audience knows this all too well. But this, it, these movements, these numbers are tied to the political events taking place in Latin America that sends political exiles first and then economic exiles in their wake, beginning obviously with the revolution, but then the Marielitos, and then uh, when the uh, uh, Contras come to power in Nicaragua, the obvious place for Nicaraguans to go in exile was Miami. It had already been set up as a place where you could speak Spanish and go in political exile, uh, then the Balseros, and then Chavismo, and then everywhere there was a political uh, event in Latin America where elites needed to leave, they went to Miami. And all of that is a political story, but it's also a linguistic story. Here are the major Miami-Dade municipalities, and I'm just showing you this to point out that they are all 50% or more Hispanic Latino. Okay, so now we're a few hundred years into the colonial part of the narrative, so Spanish and English are set up in their respective you know, so-called countries or whatever in the Americas. And we're about 60 years into the Cubanization of South Florida and the subsequent Latinization of South Florida, where an English monolingual majority was gradually replaced by a Spanish-speaking, English-speaking, bilingual Hispanic majority. And at this stage, we can finally ask the question, what was the effect on English of this entire uh, timeline? And I want to start to answer that question by looking at what we know from other dialects of American English. Um, and I'll just read what's on the screen. Uh, Non-English substrate influence on English in the US. Immigrant language influences often persist after the immigrant language is lost. And this happens all over the place. Um, we know from the study of American dialects that uh, over many decades that when the, the, the so-called immigrant language, which is a problematic term, but when the immigrant language recedes, it often leaves vestiges, not only in the lexicon, but also in the phonology and sometimes in the grammar. Uh, various kinds of lexical, uh, uh, phonological, and grammatical influences 
of German, Scandinavian, and Native American. I've just listed the studies, and we don't have time to go through all of these. But in Pennsylvania, there are a number of studies over the past 100 years looking at the influence of German. In Minnesota, looking at Scandinavian and German, Native American languages such as Cherokee, leaving their mark on the way that people speak English as durable substrate influences producing recognizable language varieties or dialects as their effect. And then Spanish. <clears throat> Way more studies just focusing on Spanish in diverse parts of the country, New York City, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, uh, the Mid-Atlantic South, Mexican-Americans, California, Texas, and the Southwest. Well-documented substratal influence from Spanish on dialects, uh, recognizable dialects, Chicano English, Tejano English. The, you know, so it's not just Miami where Spanish is leaving its mark. However, relative to the number of immigrants and relative to the number of immigrant languages, durable substrate influences from these languages when those languages other than English recede are relatively rare. Um, and it has been demonstrated time and again that children of the immigrant generation learn the pattern of their peers, not of their parents, right? So like, say we have um, a couple who moves from Saigon to Kansas City with their young children or their children are born in Kansas City, the kids are going to grow up not learning the so-called non-native features of their parents' Vietnamese accent in English, but rather the speech of their peers at school, right? For this reason, uh, there are far fewer uh, substratal effects from uh, immigrant languages than you would expect because kids are learning the, the English of their contiguous uh, community, uh, not from their parents, okay? However, there are situations in which uh, substratal effects do occur. And these are the situations in which immigrant language, uh, situ uh, immigrant languages leave its lasting mark. And it is, as Senkoff says, exceptions tend to be cases in which the immigrant group and its descendants have become the local majority. So when there is a type of um, displacement or a new community is created in which the immigrant group is the majority, then we start to see more significant types of influence from below. And I just want to say, voila, this is precisely the situation, as you saw a few slides ago, that we've witnessed in Miami since the Cuban Revolution. OK, so now, <clears throat> what do the linguists say about South Florida, the dialectologists? This is a very important book, The Atlas of North American English, published by Lebov, Ash, and Boberg. They say this. They say Florida belongs to a number of marginal areas. Um, it lies outside the definition of the South as the area of monofungal I like in, you know, the, the pronunciation of back, bike, for, um, or tad for tide. Okay, however, it is not completely devoid of southern character, belongs to the southeastern region that is defined of an area of uh, fronting of O, so boat for boat, and no low back merger, so the splitting of caught and caught. Okay, so what I'm saying is that description is fine and good for maybe Florida as such, but not for Miami, because Miami does not, Miami is orthogonal to this description. Um, and there really have not been any studies to investigate the English of the majority population, namely Cubans and Cuban Americans and other Latinx descendant groups um, in Miami. And so this description just is great for Florida, but does not cut it for, for Miami. So now I want you to listen to one of the participants in our study whom we have named, or actually this person named themselves, uh, Maria. So I see the Miami people in the audience are smiling because they're <laughs> the Miami people recognize it. Um, Maria is Cuban American. She's 22 years old, and she tells a common story, which is I thought that you know my English was just regular English until I went out of Miami Dade County, I went to Broward County, or I went to Tennessee in this case, and they said you sound different, which of course is the experience of all dialect speakers when they leave their 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 uh, home region. And Maria um, exemplifies some of the uh, phonetic features that we're going to be looking at in a second. So the study of English in Miami is the first large-scale linguistic analysis of English in South Florida. We have a corpus of about 50 sociolinguistic interviews 
with mostly Cuban Americans in the second generation. I can, I'm going to just describe the methods from all this, and we can do it in the discussion if you want. OK, so um, let's get into the linguistic details. We, uh, as we've published a number of studies on this, and we've looked at different types of linguistic structures, but we decided to start with the vowel system, because the vowel system is a, is a great and easy place to diagnose um, influence from another language in a contact situation, especially when it's English and Spanish, because English has a complicated vowel system with like 14 vowels in American English, and Spanish is really simple, five plus three diphthongs, and so it makes it an interesting place to check uh, for, uh, for cross-linguistic influence. And we, we looked at the variables that are, well, a whole suite of variables, these vowels that are shown here, but the ones that I'm going to review today are in bold. And we started with the vowel a, as in the word ash, for two reasons. Number one, it doesn't exist in Spanish. And number two, in American English, it behaves in a really weird way, such that there's two allophones, two pronunciations that are constrained by the phonetic environment, such that when it occurs before nasal sounds, like N and M in orthography, it's raised in the mouth. So you say um, hand, can, and man, but you say ash and trash. I don't know if you perceive that difference, but they're, they're different. Um, but in Spanish-influenced dialects, Chicano English, for example, we know, Tejano English, we know, um, speakers resist the raising before nasal, so the pronunciation sounds like hand, can, and man, the same as in ash and trash, not hand, can, and man. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, we looked at that one. We also wanted to look at u, which exists in English and in Spanish, but has different actual, the phonetic properties are different. Um, in Spanish, u tends to be produced at the back of the mouth and high, and in English, it is ever more fronted, 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 such that words like boot sound like boot, OK? Uh, and then we wanted to look at uh, I, which again is in both languages, but has slightly different uh, properties. Then we uh, decided to look at prosodic rhythm, so the timing of the languages, which we are able to quantify and then compare. Uh, Spanish is said to have uh, uh, syllables of more or less equal durations that recur in regular intervals. English is said to have syllables of different vari of different durations that occur in syllabic feet. Okay, so the syllabic structure and the durational elements of syllables in the two languages is different. So this also makes an interesting meeting ground for studying uh, cross linguistic influence. Namely, does the English of Miamians, Cubans, Cubans Americans sound a little bit more like Spanish in the way that it's timed? So. For those of you who are unfamiliar with phonetic analysis, I think maybe many of the people watching at home, um, I just want to show you this brief x-ray video, which is, I'm going to tell you, a little bit weird. But it's a sagittal section of someone's head being x-rayed as they just articulate words. So you can see what I'm talking about with the movement of the tongue. You all do this your whole lives as you speak, but it's arresting to just see it. Um, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, just an idea. A <laughs> Okay, so the point is that a sound wave is emitted from the larynx, the vocal folds, they vibrate. A sound wave ascends through the vocal tract and then is modulated by the movements of the articulators inside the oral cavity, aka the mouth. Okay? And um, <laughs> when that happens, the tongue produces, the tongue movements produce different vowels and different acoustic chambers that can be measured for resonance. And that's how we conduct acoustic phonetic analysis. And that's what I'm going to show you next. Oops, we don't want to do that again. OK, so <clears throat> we measured vowels uh, using the phonetic software PROT, um, 15 to 25 vowels of each. And I can answer any questions that you may have about methods later. We followed the standard procedures that are set forth in the citations on the screen. Um, I do want to mention one thing. We took the two measurements. One is called F1, and it shows the first formant in the, in the acoustics wave, and it shows the height of the, of the tongue position in the mouth. And the second formant we call F2, it shows the frontness or backness. Okay, and this is how we're able to locate the uh, acoustic resonance of the vowel in the oral cavity, and it gives us a sense of how the vowels may be influenced by contact. So this plot. This plot shows us all the vowels for uh, the Cuban-American speakers in this sample and the non-Latinx, non-Cuban Anglo whites. They are in unfilled shapes. The Latinxes are in uh, filled shapes. 
And if you study it very closely, you're gonna see the patterning emerge, but right now it looks like a jumble, so I'll just go through the, uh, the, vowel, the variables vowel by, by vowel. This plot depicts the normalized vowel height, F1, and F2 vowel frontness and backness for the vowel A before nasal, so in words like man, can, and hand, man, can, and hand, and we wanna know how are people pronouncing this? Is it like man, hand, and can, or man, can, and hand? Okay, and our primary interest is in that F1, so the height, whether the tongue goes up before nasals or stays low. Um, and the vowel plot shows a lower F1 location for a, we call it ash before nasals, for majority of the Cuban speakers, as compared to the Anglo-white non-Cubans, a finding borne out in the results of our statistical analysis, and this is P, is less than 0.001. We did statistical uh, testing for F2 and found the uh, another statistical statistically significant finding that the Cubans have a more backed pronunciation as well. So our first question is answered affirmatively. We also looked at the same vowel without the nasal consonants where we, don't ex we, we didn't expect to find any difference because there's none attested in the literature between Latinxes and non-Latinxes. So words like trash and ash, where there is no raising of the F1, we didn't expect to find a difference, but we did find one where the Cuban group is uh, more backed and higher and those are uh, statistically significant findings as well. This plot depicts the results for the vowel U and shows that Latinx speakers, Cuban Americans in our case, produce more backed vowels and that confirms the hypothesis. The Spanish U is back, Cuban Americans speaking uh, English have a more backed pronunciation than the Anglos. We didn't expect to find a difference on the F1 dimension, the height, because no such difference is attested in the literature but the Cuban American group is different from the Anglos there as well. We found no difference for I, so we'll just move, move on to the next variable. I will do this very quickly. Um, this is a uh, spectrogram and it's how we measure the duration of speech, it's how we measure the vowels too, but when I show you A, B, and C, each one of those, this is the acoustic resonance for a vowel and then we me measure the duration here, we measure the duration here, and we measure the duration here and we plug those durations into this equation, and it gives you a um, measure of uh, present, of prosodic rhythm. A, a higher score indicates more stress-like timing like in English, a lower score indicates more syllable timing like in Spanish. In our sample, we have about 3,000 measurements across the, the group, and what we found is a statistically significant difference between uh, Anglos and uh, Cubans, such that the Cuban group have a significantly lower PVI score, meaning a more Spanish-like pronunciation of timing. It's not about fast or slow. It's about how regular the, uh, the durations of the syllables are and how regular the syllables delete, so, uh, repeat. So the syllables could be really long or really short. They tend to be shorter, um, but they're repeating at regular intervals. This graph, uh, shows what happens when we plot the uh, Cuban American group with other groups. These are the Miami non-Cubans. We measured um, a control group of Spanish monolinguals and you can see that Spanish is significantly lower than all of the English speaking groups. But you can see that the, the, the Latinx ness of speaking English uh, pulls the uh, prosodic rhythm down looking more like Spanish than like English. So an interim summary, we see influence of Spanish on the Miami English vowel system, number one, in the ways that we've shown, and we see influence of Spanish on the rhythmic timing of English in Miami. Okay, so that's the vowel system. Now let me show you uh, the lexicon. This is what we're doing on time. Okay, so one of the things that makes Miami English distinctive aside from the phonetic properties that I've just reviewed are some unique words and expressions. And for a number of years, we've kept an archive of calc expressions. A calc is similar to a barring in that both words enter a target language from uh, a source language, but whereas a barring comes into the target language as is, maybe with uh, phonological adaptations, a calc is literally translated. And so for that reason, sometimes we call these loan translations. And there are many, 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 many of these floating around Miami, pass the vacuum, drink a pill, take sun from Tomar Sol, uh, the use of bring for ingredients like um, the sandwich brings mayonnaise from El Sandwich Trae Mayonesa, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, ground for 
floor given the breadth of the semantic range for el suelo in Spanish. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And I want to show you um, some of the ones that we've collected and studied in the following slides. So in these slides, the next five or six, you'll see an A, B, and a C. Spanish is the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, letter A is the Spanish, obviously, with an underlined word that could be calped in Miami or elsewhere, which is uh, illustrated in B. And then C is a non-calped version. OK, so let's just go through these in turn. He invited me a beer. All right, the verb invitar in Spanish has a wider semantic range than in English, as most of you know. While it conveys the sense of I invited him to a party, uh, the Spanish semantic Entry can also be like to treat, as in I, I'll treat you to a beer, or however you say that in English. And we consider this a semantic calc with grammatical consequences in that the local use of invite ends up taking a ditransitive verb with two objects, a beer and me, as an indirect object. So I guess what I want to say about that is less than anyone think that it's because it's the lexicon, it's superficial and not important. Well, number one, the lexicon is important, but number two, it does, I mean, this is how grammar changes in language. When you start importing tons of words, it tinkers with the grammar just a little bit at first, and then more and more and more and more. So a lot of these things look like just word translations, but they have these grammatical consequences as well that I just want to point to as we go through them. Uh, the next one gives us two. Carmen se casó con Antonio y gracias a Dios no llovió. Carmen married with Antonio and thanks God that it didn't rain. OK, so married with, it's just casarse con. And we hear that in Miami, uh, Carmen is married with Antonio. Now, thanks God, this one ends up being an important part of the story. You'll see why in a minute. Uh, we have a couple of hypotheses for this. One is that it's a type of uh, phonological calc, namely that the S is just calced from gracias to thanks. The other is that it's like metaphorically extended. The other is that it's a morphological adaptation, because while uh, thank in the English expression, thank God, yeah, thank God, is a verb. Yeah, thank God. Uh, thanks, gracias, in Spanish is a noun. So it could be a morphological calc in that sense. Right? OK. <clears throat> this is uh, just a literal lexical calc. Nos bajamos del carro. Y entramos en el supermercado para comprar comida. So the first one is clear, and the second one uh, for to buy. OK. Um, Rather than using the verbs encender or prender, some Spanish speakers may use the verb poner uh, in the sense of like flip on a light, ponme la luz. Um, and we hear this in Miami, put the light, put me the light. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, if you're, yeah, OK, all right. So um, mo <laughs> most varieties of Spanish use the verb sacar or tomar to express the action of taking a photo, but if you're in Cuba, you, um, you might hear tirar, right? And if you're in Miami, you definitely hear tirar. And so then that comes out as throw a photo. <laughs> Recommends me the movie. There's a bunch of these types of verbs that have in English that take an indirect object, but in Spanish take a direct object. So you get the kind of object placement moving around. Uh, recommended me. Marta me recomienda esta película. Marta recommended me the movie. And we, I hear that all the time. Miamians in the room, I think that probably sounds very, very at home. OK, so this is kind of what started me on this whole thing, actually, once being in a gas station. Um, I don't know if you recognize this image, but it's a bake case. Um, and it's empty right now because they were sold out. But normally, this would have empanadas. And over here, you see the sign says, Chick I made this photo, chicken empanada, ham cheese empanada, and here, meat empanada. And I was looking at this, and I thought, wait a second. Uh, a meat empanada, OK. Uh, so um, does anybody know what I'm talking about? So like, so Spanish carne, I guess I have to explain. So, oh, uh, here. One that's very, very subtle that sometimes people from here don't know that they're, they're doing is the use of uh, meat for beef. Because in Spanish, carne can refer to uh, the entire class of meat. And it can also refer specifically to beef as such. So in my English, people say, I would like two chicken and bananas and two meat and bananas. And everyone here knows that a meat and banana refers to beef. We decided to take this calc to the test. How did you order an empanada sandwich? Did I have a meat empanada? Uh, I usually order that in Spanish. <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> <It's> a <laughs> meat, meat empanada. 
harder study to trace the okay. first one that's very, very subtle that sometimes people don't. Okay, so we wanted to subject the these expressions and others that we had collected in our archive just from listening and from sociolinguistic interviews to formal studies. So we designed two experiments. The first is a production task to see how people produce them um, and we it, how they produce them in a controlled setting. And we also wanted to know, are these just a function of immigrants? Because you expect immigrant, immigrant speech to use these type of expressions as people are acquiring the target language. They lean into their, their home language and they, they, they translate. Okay, that's fine. But the theoretical question, the empirical question that animated the study was, do these get passed down to their kids and to their grandkids? So we designed a translation task to deal with that. And then um, I'll, I'll show you the, per, the perception test next. So our participants in the first experiment were 15 people born in Cuba who came to Miami as adults, 12 second generation Cuban Americans born in Miami and four non-Cuban American Latinxes. And we asked each group to simply translate sentences from Spanish, like what I showed you in the prior uh, slides, into English and see what they, they do with them. And then we tabulate the results and it looks like this. These are all the test sentences. We didn't review all of them for the, for the sake of time. This shows the results for the Cuban immigrant group and it shows a robust use of these expressions across the board. The only test expressions for which we did not find a calc was uh, tirar una foto, throw a photo, and four to buy from para comprar. Um, it, but in general, people, they're, they're translating these as direct translations as, as kind of calc, lexico-semantic calc situations. And that's exactly what we would expect because they're immigrants, their first language is, uh, their first and dominant language is Spanish. But what about their children? Okay, so this graph shows the data for the second generation Cuban Americans and shows that although the numbers decline a little bit, the expressions have not fallen out of use, they're robust, and in certain cases they actually increase. So the second generation are saying, uh, definitely meat and panada. We do find a throw a photo in the second generation. Put me la luz, put the light, get down from the car. They're all in there. This shows both groups, the uh, Cuban immigrants in orange bars and the second generation Cuban Americans in blue bars. And so once we had formal evidence, we know that they exist because we hear them. We live in the city, right? We have them in our sociolinguistic interviews. But we had them in this controlled setting. And once we knew that we had evidence that they were in the second generation, we wanted to understand how that represented in perception. So how do people perceive of these when they hear them? Do they recognize them as distinctive? Um, are they at or are they at below or above the level of conscious awareness or salience? Are there certain expressions that are stigmatized and so forth? And these questions will help us predict how these uh, expressions will be diffused in the speech community, if they're durable or if they're ephemeral and will go away. <clears throat> so we asked, we gave uh, participants 52 test sentences, 18 with local expressions, so get down from the car, 18 non-local expressions, get out of the car, and 16 filler statements. We used 14 of the 15 statements from the production task, and then we added four more expressions, which I, we, they were, we asked them to rate on the scale. And we added four additional uh, calc expressions, one make the line, a literal lexical calc, this I wanted to add because I, I started hearing it around Miami and commercial exchanges. So you know how in Spanish um, it's uh, whole unit, dollars, euros, or pesos, or whatever, plus con, plus uh, the unit. So cuarenta y cuatro con diez, right? Like if you're making change. And we hear this in Miami, 44 with 10. OK, rather than uh, $44.10, right? Which is kind of like the way that you would say it elsewhere. So we observed these in naturalistic language settings, and so we included it in the experiment. It's not for anything. Um, speakers of some dialects of Spanish may, may say, no es por nada. You know that one? Yeah. Like express, how do you, how do you want to say that in English? Mind you. Mind you, or like, yeah, okay. Mind you, get context for no reason, not sure, things like that. So we've observed that um, impressionistically, and we have it in our field work as well, so we decided to include it. I need to warn you, there's an expletive in the next one. I think we can handle it. Um, eating shit uh, to express the idea of doing nothing or wasting time. Speakers of Cuban Spanish use the colloquial expression comer mierda to eat shit, and we've observed comer mierda in Cuban Spanish all over Miami, but also the literal lexical calc eating shit in Miami English. So we tested all of these 18 expressions in two groups, 58 raters, Miami-born Latinxes, mostly Cuban-Americans, and 187 participants from outside of South Florida using Mechanical Turk. 
This figure presents the mean ratings for each of the local Spanish influence expressions for both raiders, Miami raiders and national raiders. The national raiders are in blue, the Cuban Americans are in orange. And looking at the average ratings, several important findings are evident. Um, first, Miami raiders frequently found the local expressions to be more acceptable than the national raiders, irrespective of the specific rating, rating provided for an expression. So whether they said it was perfect or horrible, the Miamians were a few notches over towards the more acceptable side, okay? And that was the case for 13 of the 18 expressions, or 72%. So the Miamians are more cool with them than the non-Miamians. Second, although Miami Raiders were frequently more favorable of local expressions than national Raiders, both groups were often in agreement on the unacceptability of local expressions. For example, with average scores between three awkward sounding and four horrible sounding, both groups said, uh, put me the light, sounds bad. Okay, they were both in agreement with that. Uh, that is, though the Miami group was frequently more favorable to local expressions than the national group, the, the two didn't necessarily disagree. It's not like one was saying, oh, this is perfect and this is awful. There are, however, some exceptions. National Raiders and Miami Raiders differed the greatest in their assessment of the local expressions make the line, which was rated awkward by national listeners and okay by Miamians. For national Raiders, get down from the car sounded awkward, while Miami Raider, Raiders said it sounded perfect. And as expected, eating shit was awkward for the national Raiders and sounded perfect to Miamians. <laughs> oh, one more. Meat and Panah was okay for national Raiders and perfect for Miami. So in order to understand how perceptions of local expressions relate to the national ones, we ran linear mixed model regression analysis to test the interaction between perceptions of expressions for both groups of raters. And considering the aggregate sample, national, uh, local and national expressions, local and national raters, the model shows that Miamians find local expressions significantly more favorable overall than national uh, raters, confirming our primary hypothesis. And let me just pause to say why that's important. That's important because if they are rated favorably, and if they are below the level of conscious awareness or above the level of conscious awareness and still favorable, then they're probably gonna stick around, all right? Uh, this graph shows a difference measure, the mean national expression ratings minus the mean local expression ratings, and it shows four things, and I'm gonna tell you what those are. First, the vast majority of scores are negative for both groups, so below this zero line, uh, which means that the national expressions are rated more acceptable than the local expressions almost across the board. So although the Miamians are more favorable than the national raters for the local expressions, when given a choice, they all say the national ones sound better. So get out of the car is rated more favorably than get down from the car, even among Miamians. Second, the Spanish-influenced expressions are actually preferred by Miamians over the national expressions in only three cases. Adverbial super, super um, which we didn't discuss, but I can tell you about later, as in super big. Uh, Give me a chance from Dame un chance, which is actually a circulation, it's a borrowing into Spanish back into English. Um, and then meat empanada, which we've talked about. Miamians preferred those over, Miamians don't want to say beef, let's put it that way. Um, <clears throat> third, although both groups rated the national expressions higher than the local ones, Miamians rated the local expressions statistically more favorably than the national raters, and this was borne out for six expressions, get down from the car, recommend me a movie, invite me a beer, eating shit, not for anything, and make the line, okay? And finally, this is the interesting, interesting one in my view, the general pattern in which Miamians found the local expressions more favorable than national raters is reversed for four expressions. So this is the case where the Miamians rated the local expressions more disfavorably than the national raters. Number one is thanks God, okay? Number two is throw a photo, Number three is thinking in, and number four is for to buy. And I don't have a hard and fast answer for why this is, but I suspect it's because, well, number one, we know that they use these forms because we found them in the experiment, and number two, we hear them around town. But I suspect that they are rated so lowly. I mean, it's, it's a big jump to go from uh, on par with the national raters to hating them more than the national raters. And I think it's because they are salient as non-native sounding uh, features, and that is something to be avoided. I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that maybe in the discussion. Uh, this just shows us um, a difference of different score that shows how the items are ordered from most to least favorable among the Miamians. So 
wait, making the line, get down from the car, eating shit. Those are all very normal and unproblematic in Miami. Uh, thanks God, thinking in and throwing a photo. <clears throat> Miamians don't like those, even though we know that they use them. So I thought I'd end this part of the presentation with this that shows you people's reactions to thanks God and other forms. I'm married with someone instead of married to. I just say that. Married. I just say that. Okay. What about thanks God instead of thank God? Thank God. We've heard it. We don't say it. We've heard it. Ordering empanadas and they're like, I want a chicken empanada, I want a cheese empanada, and I want a meat empanada instead of a beef. I say meat empanada. Meat empanada. EFIE professor okay. behind this study. I'm married with... Okay, all right, we're running out of time. So I said at the outset of the talk that my fourth goal was to say something about why this, this research has gotten so much media attention, social media and mass media attention, not only in Miami and the United States, but really all over the world. And I would love to talk about this in the discussion, but I'll, I'll just give you the story briefly. I published a piece in the conversation about the calcs. The conversation is a, a venue for scholars to write popular articles. And I wrote like a thousand word article about the Miami calc situation that was read by 1.9 million people. <laughs> and then that opened up all of these stories. I mean, this is just a very small sample of many, many hundreds of news stories that were published um, online in papers of record and on television about this topic. And I think it's, um, May, we'll, we'll discuss it maybe in the Q&A, but I think there's two things. One is people are interested in Miami as a place that is both of the United States and kind of outside of the United States in a way, and that has appeal. But also that people are um, living in recognition that the things that they are taught about language in formal institutions do not align with their experiences of language. And this is both in Miami and elsewhere. I mean, we've said that there are 55 million speakers of Spanish in the United States who get, who, uh, who receive messages about language, about English being the only language of the United States, or whatever, uh, ideologies and epistemologies that suggest that their home language practices are deficient or problematic or not of the norm, but yet they know better because they live it. And so then they see this research and I think it resonates with them. And I think that is my view of why the research went viral. So let me give you some conclusions to this and then maybe we can talk it out for a little bit. Number one. Miami English is an ethnic regional variety of American English spoken primarily in Miami-Dade County by Cuban Americans as a first language variety of English. The variety is shaped by the contact situation with Spanish taking place in South Florida since the end of the Cuban Revolution. Conclusion two, Miami English shares the vast majority of its features with the other varieties of American English, including at the level of the lexicon, phonology, morphology, and syntax. Its unique features shape through the contact situation with Spanish are systematic and rule governed like all language features of all language varieties. Number three, the variety emerged as such not only because of contact between Spanish and English, but also because of the unique political, demographic, and historical situation that shaped the duration, intensity, and power dynamics of the contact situation taking place in South Florida and the speakers involved in that contact situation. Number four, Miami English is uh, but one of many varieties of American English shaped by contact with Spanish. They're really all over the country. Uh, though the shape and sound of Miami English is unique, many of the features, prosodic rhythm for one, the notion of get down from the car. I had people writing me from all over the country saying, we say get down from the car. We say in California, we say in Arizona, we say in Texas, are shared with these varieties. Miami English is the latest inflection in the long dance between Spanish and English in the Americas. Number five. The ability to study the development of Miami English, this is a disciplinary point, uh, in real time owes to the developments of socially oriented branches of linguistics, especially dialectology, quantitative social linguistics, and contact linguistics. We are able to do that because of developments uh, in the discipline. And number six, the ability to study the development of Miami English in real time reminds us that every language variety, including every feature, every sound, every word, every piece of morphology, has a history, and that history is a people's history and a political history and a function of time, power, and movement. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Philip. Let me just open the door again for this really fascinating, comprehensive, detailed account of this, the formation of this new variety of English in 
in in Miami. It's really it's it's really intriguing and and uh, and very relevant and and uh, and I think it opens uh, uh, many ways to 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 go with the research and with the, this examination of this uh, new dialect. Uh, so any questions? All right, very interesting. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question. I don't know if you mentioned this, maybe, and I missed it, but is there any, any of these features is shared by uh, also the Anglos? So is in any way uh, the creation of this new variety for some of the features also involves you know, the, the non-Latinos? Yeah. And, and the other question I have related to that is, is uh, what is the role of identity in all of this? Is there any some sort of you know, indexicality in the, in the you know, uh, the work of Penelope Eckert. Mm -hmm. um, so is there anything of that sort? Yeah, two great questions. Um, we have not studied the speech of <coughs> non-Latinxes other than the control groups that you saw in this, but we have lots of anecdotal evidence that non-Latinx speakers are using certain elements of it, where I have colleagues at FIU who are Anglo-white and they say, whose kids are also Anglo-white, and they say, oh, my kids sound like this thing that you study. Mm -hmm. um, or kids who are able to code switch, like they may not speak that way at home, but they're able to code switch or be like kind of bi-dialectal with their friends, um, which is not unexpected because this is what kids who are in numerical majority, numerical minority situations often have to do to learn to kind of broach um, differences in their social settings of their schools and so forth. Um, we know that Haitian Americans use certain of the calc expressions not because they get it through contact via Spanish, but because one also gets down from the car in front. So there, it, there ends up being kind of a, um, a camouflaging effect from Spanish and French where the Haitians happen to use the same form as the Latinxes. Um, and it, that does create a kind of similitude in the speech community. And then in terms of identity, we know that um, these features do have salience because of pop cultural formations like around the memes that we were talking about before, only in Miami-Dade County, social media that plays with this stuff and videos that were produced literally 10 years ago that you can watch on YouTube that I actually meant to put in this and forgot, whoops. Um, uh, shit Miami girls say, shit Miami guys say, where they are very deliberate in um, satirizing what Miami English sounds like. And so we know that when it rises to the level of stereotype ability, that people are aware of the speech variety and they're able to play with it in that way. Does that? Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's interesting what you were saying, uh, the, the yeah, first lady. First lady said, oh, when I went to Tennessee, they started telling mm -hmm. me, okay, you sound different. So she was not aware of what she's doing. But um, my impression is that at some level, in these types of situations, you know, that the community is somehow, they know that they sound mm -hmm. different. Not for every single feature, or they cannot explain that in a very yeah. technical way. But uh, somehow, uh, you know, um, in a way, it's like, oh, I didn't know I sound different, but somehow, I guess there is some level of conscience to it, right? Yeah. I think that a lot has also changed in the last few years. And there are Miamians in the audience. So if Miamians in the audience want to chime in at any time, you're welcome. You're as much an expert as me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually, I had the same question as Andrea, so I'm going to ask a different one. You mentioned something about, uh, about what I'm going to ask about in one of your conclusions which is that some of these features are also seen in other co uh, mm -hmm. mm, contexts with a strong Latino uh, community as, as California. So that's where I was going to ask, are you aware of any studies similar to yours having been done in, in California? Yeah. And do they show mm, similarities and differences? Mm -hmm. Because obviously the, 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 the Hispanic community varies from mostly from a Mexican origin. Mm -hmm. Or Mexican origin rather than a Cuban origin, yeah. and do they show the same uh, kind of influence mm -hmm. in, in, for example, on the phonetic level, on the lexical level? Yeah, great question. Yeah. There's so much research on Latinx varieties of English outside of Miami. Carmen Fault has a book published in 2003 called Chicano English in Context. It's about Chicanos in East LA. Um, and it, she goes into their vowel system, she studies ash, she finds very, very similar things with ash and ooh. Um, and she looks at the social patterning of 
who more than I do. We have, we've just looked at this at a dialectal level. We haven't really looked at like the social patterning yet. Um, so like what social groups are making, you know, when these things um, start to accrue social meaning, like how do, how do speakers play with them and use them in like local identity formations, we haven't gotten that far. Um, but she has a book that does that. But there's um, work going back to the 1960s and 70s documenting these types of features in New Mexico and Arizona and, you know, the dialectology literature is replete with this type of stuff. Um, but as ever, just like, okay, Spanglish. Spanglish in, uh, in Puerto Rico, you know, in Puerto Rico and New York is different than Spanglish in Cuban Miami, is different than, Mex you know, Chicano Spanglish on the border, is different than East LA Spanglish. You know, it's all, it's all Spanglish, but they come out in different configurations because the inputs are a little bit different. Um, and I think of um, Latinx Englishes as very similar to that, that they're, there's a certain through line that can be traced from, you know, California and Texas and New Mexico and Miami and New York and whatever, because the vast majority of the features of, you, you, igual se baja del carro, right? <coughs> Where, wherever you're coming from. Mm -hmm. But um, the other lexical expressions are different and even certain of the phonetic thing. We know, for instance, that the, the timing is the same. There are studies of Puerto Ricans um, in New York City, uh, Mexicans in North Carolina, Chicanos in Southern California and Cubans in Miami and the timing is, is almost identical um, in terms of the rhythm. Mm -hmm. But some of the other features differ. No one else is saying eating shit, for example. <laughs> yeah. In Spain, actually, come mierda has a completely different meaning, hasn't it? I don't know. I don't, don't want to go into a discussion well, on that, but that, we don't, I mean, we don't that, use it in the same, in the same, that, with the same meaning. Yeah, no, no. But that meaning also exists in Cuba, but it has the meaning of also not, of, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is actually a follow-up question, maybe the reverse. This is a, a really fascinating talk. Um, and I'm wondering about, are there any other particularities of the, the Cuban influence in Miami that you discovered that could be lexical, like come mierda, or other words that they use in Cuba? Or um, syntactical, like for instance, in Cuba, they're, I've noticed, this is anecdotal, that in using the past tense, they're much more likely to mirror Spain. So, me ha dado instead of me dio, which is what you'd hear normally in many other countries in Latin America. So does any of that translate? Those are good questions. Syntax? I don't have an answer for that with the English yet, but there's, I mean, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, this, I feel like these are also, we've been working on this for 10 years, but it's still kind of like first passes. <laughs> in a way because we've done a lot of other stuff too involving perception tests involving work on spanish as such um but that's a good question we were talking about this earlier like what um how the specific the the specific characteristics of a dialect as such influence the outputs when they come through english like like last night we were at, at dinner this is for an accented speech not dialect so that's it's not the same right but but the, the couple next to us were speaking English and they were also speaking Spanish. And when they spoke English, I said, I think they're Spaniards from the, from the English, not from the Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. so, like it's distinctive, you can kind of tell. Mm -hmm. um, and so one wonders, you know, over the course of time, dialects don't happen, they don't say, they, they happen from, you know, generations. Um, so it's an interesting question to imagine what things about Cuban Spanish as such come out in the English generations down the line. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a question. Uh, my ex-husband, he was born in Havana. He was brought to New York when he was three months old. With five years, he was brought to Miami. Okay. He lived in Miami until he was maybe 25. He went back to New York and then to Spain. Uh, but I never noticed in his speech any of these features. Maybe he lost it in New York. Or maybe is it that there are any any um, variations also within the, the Cuban population in, in Miami? Yeah. Are there any variations in the way that maybe social or educational or? Yeah. yeah, for sure. So like any speech community, if we go to Madrid, mm -hmm. not all madrileños sound like madrileño, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, or if we go to, um, I mean, name a dialect of anywhere in the world, not everybody in the community sounds the same, right? And it, there, it is always, all, speech communities are always stratified by the vectors of identification that are salient in that community, sea lo que sean, if it's socioeconomic class, if it's level of education, if it's neighborhood, if it's race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, so there are people who uh, are Cuban American in the second generation who use, say, the calc expression, certain of them, but have none of the phonology. Or people who have ton of the phonology and tons of the calcs, but they don't have the rhythmic timing, right? So. It just depends on, you know, these are the vagaries of someone's own circumstances that produce their, their language as the effect. I mean, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so 
tengo una, una cosita curiosa. Eh, esto de ponme la luz, uh -huh. eh, yo en Cuba nunca lo oí, ponme la luz. Entonces me pregunto, y en Miami tampoco, me pregunto si no será influencia de otro, de otro grupo étnico en Miami que haya llegado a él. Puede ser. Porque no, no me suena. Y, y bueno, esto de eh, dame un chance uh -huh. es algo que usamos en Cuba toda la vida, ¿no? Entonces, chance en español. Claro, chance, chance es, es una curiosidad porque chance que viene es de inglés curioso. al español y luego es un calco sí, nuevamente sí, sí. Al, al inglés. Es, es Igual muy... que super, que super que viene de inglés, de préstamo al español uh -huh. y luego es un reciclaje al inglés. Eso es muy curioso. Y también en lo que viene siendo ya la, el, el acento y lo nasal. Esto me pasó a mí como cubana, que me crié en Cuba, no, trabajé allá, viví treinta y pico de años. Me fui a México, trabajé por todo México, me relacioné con, con el, el habla relacionado a su vez con las diferentes lenguas indígenas. Y cuando regresé, después de algunos años sin ir a Cuba, llegué y dije, ay Dios mío, aquí todo el mundo está fañoso. Pañoso, o sea, nasal. <risa> es una palabra que usamos en Cuba. Pero lo gracioso es que yo estaría fañosa también <risa> y no me daba cuenta, ¿no? Es, es bien curioso la manera en que, en que se, se claro. habla así. Lo que pasa es que en Miami estamos hablando de cubanos y cubanoamericanos, pero los cubanos son menos de un 50% de la población latina en total. Y cada vez menos, ¿eh? porque hay cada vez más venezolanos, colombianos, argentinos. Entonces todo eso también tiene que ver. Y son cosas que son cosas, son preguntas empíricas de las cuales tendremos que estudiar. Seguramente pongo la luz viene porque se usa en Centroamérica. Tal vez. Tal vez. Muchas gracias. Muy, muy interesante. Gracias. Um, estaba pensando, voy a comentar dos cosas. Vale. Uno, eh, yo creo que utiliza usted um, el español, la influencia del español como un término general sobre el inglés de Miami. Um, no sé si debería hablar en inglés o qué. No, Maybe, in English, in English, okay. okay. So, okay, so you're, 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 you're using, I believe, uh, the term uh, Sp Spanish, the influence uh, of Spanish on the, uh, the English of Miami City. Uh, would you consider adding Cuban Spanish? Because I think phonetically uh, speaking, the, the, the rhythm, the, the modulation and all, all this is, is quite different from, let's say, the Spanish from Spain or, right. or, or Mexico or so. <laughs> Maybe if the influence is mostly Cuban, then perhaps you should consider <laughs> adding Cuban Spanish. Yeah. Uh, this is just a suggestion. Yeah, let me comment on that one real quick, and then I'll hear your second point. I think an even more important thing would be to designate the English as Cuban American English, um, because I think you know it's an important. I, I don't have an answer to this yet. And again, the Miamians in the room, I'm you know interested in your perceptions as well, but like. The like when I played Maria, um, I don't know if you remember that phonology, but to me Maria sounds Cuban. She doesn't necessarily sound, I don't know what you think. Um, it sounds Miami, but it also sounds specifically Cuban. Um, so, I mean, it's an important theoretical and then empirical question as to whether or not Colombians and Venezuelans are both participating in these patterns and adding to these patterns in their own way. Also, an another comment on, on the the vowel U, mm -hmm. U. Um, I understood perfectly what you were saying, but I'm wondering if you have researched or you have tested uh, people reading in English, uh, Cuban Americans mm -hmm. reading English where the vowel U appears, because uh, in Spanish, Right. But in English, we have, I can mention maybe five or six right now, no? Mm -hmm. Put, but, right. uh, bugle, 
burn and, right. uh, and so on. And so I'm wondering about that aspect of oh, English, right. you know, reading, mm -hmm. you know, maybe in children. Uh, have you are you saying whether or not like those, like the, like the vowels in English that are represented orthographically with the letter U, U. but yet are not U, um, are uh, pulled towards Unis because of this? How would yeah. they pronounce, yeah. you know, if they have difficulty in saying bugle, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's an interesting just question. Like, just like many, many, mm -hmm. many uh, uh, Spanish-speaking Spanish people have difficulties uh, in English pronouncing um, words ending in ture, mm -hmm. like literature. Right. You know, that ture, you know, I, I can remember certain people like uh, like Julio Iglesias, for example, <laughs> you know, having problems of this type, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering about that. Yeah. F among native, uh, among people who speak a language as their first language, reading style we know tends to be more careful and non-reading style tends to be more casual, which is why we tend to study naturalistic speech, non-reading style to get at their... Um, less careful attention. But I take your point that for folks who are maybe among immigrants, r reading reading would capture their sense of what, uh, capture the sense in which U is affecting those, those vowels in English that look like U in orthography but don't sound like U. Yeah, that's a good point. There's one, one question from the people attending in Fresno. Oh, great. Oh, and you know what? I just saw a bunch of chats. Am I supposed to look at these? No, no, no. We're looking at it. Oh, OK. Right. <laughs> um, so this person says, congrats on the presentation. Oh, Mexican Norteño living in New York City. So they're saying, considering the calks, I've heard a lot back home and here in the US that thanks God. And yeah. yes, always shame, but do you think there could be also a socioeconomical component or a class component that could be added to their research? They said, I definitely think it has some weight to the structuring given sentence structuring, which varies between the Spanglish and North, Northern Mexico and Southern Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I don't know where I look in the camera. Um, the, um, the class question is r really, really, really important, and I don't know how it pertains to the, I don't have an answer for how it pertains to the calcs, but I know that the, ca the class question is so important for language choice in Miami, and like all the sort of spectacles around um, Spanish, like when Spanish, uh, when Spanish arises as a political spectacle in Miami, it's usually class-based. So, for example, um, the news story that broke that um, at like a McDonald's or a KFC or something in Hialeah, someone went through a drive-through and um, they couldn't find someone that spoke English, and this was like in the national news. Or like I hear anecdotes amongst my students at FIU who say things like. Um, uh, Cubans, Cuban American students, um, you know, I hate it when I go into Publix and they don't speak, they don't speak English. You've heard these, yeah? Or I hate it when I get on the train and they, you know, they, they speak to me in Spanish. And inevitably the situations in which these, these um, spectacle, I call them like these Spanish language spectacles are taking place are in working class settings. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really like a class based animus. Um, where people are not mad about speaking Spanish, because guess what? there's a lot of Spanish speaking going on in corporate offices in Miami. Um, there's Spanish going on, in, you know, Spanish is going on in Banco Santander in Miami, and nobody's complaining about it. Um, but they complain about it in situations where working class people are doing it, um, because I think it kind of tarnishes the image of what, like, bilingualism is supposed to look like in Miami. Um, so I mean, that's 1,000% not an answer to the question about calcs, but I, but it is to say, I'm looking at you because you read this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, cl class is all over the, see, because Spanish lives in the whole socioeconomic hierarchy in, in Miami. It's not just in working class, it's, you know, it's the, the I mean, it, I normally show the, the class data, but the, the, the most um, wealthy neighborhood in Miami is Key Biscayne, and that's 80% Spanish speaking. And the most working class neighborhood is in and around Hialeah, and that's also 95% Spanish speaking. So it's, you know, Spanish lives in the full socioeconomic class hierarchy, and so inevitably class is going to come out um, in these forms. Thank you, whoever said that. Mm. I have a question or comment. Mm -hmm. 
In relation to the repercussion that your article has had, apart from the fact that it is because it's a really good article with a, as we said, with a really fascinating and innovative topic, do you think it might have to do this, this repercussion? That it might have to do with the fact that normally in in this context we 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 focus on the influence of English on Spanish, mm -hmm. and this is so your your approach is not only new or new, but also it distorts the the uh, the hierarchy yeah. in a way. Mm, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. so normally we we study the the uh, minority. I don't like calling it minority mm -hmm. language because it's spoken by 60 million people, but the minority language uh, being affected by the, the, the prevailing, the dominant language in this mm -hmm. bilingual context, or multilingual context, but you're approaching it on the other way around. So maybe that's, it's a fresher view or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think so. I think that people, you know, English is, English is constructed as like this uh, behemoth, this monolith, this like juggernaut that's like untouchable and it's like, um, it's in a class by itself. Mm -hmm. There's like, I mean, e we even have the term English and languages other than English, mm -hmm. right? So, um, like, and that's even us in our academic disciplinary speak, we have that notion. So, like, I think that it is arresting for people to imagine, or that, or that um, English is so tied to the nation state in ideologies that link English to Americanness. Um, along the lines of Inland, un nation, un pop, you know, one, one people, one nation, one language, mm -hmm. that English is so emblematic, um, like at the political level, but also at the deep cultural sense, that I think that for, yeah, it just is arresting for people, even though if we stop and look at the facts on paper, well, where do, you know, New York City English, Minnesota English, Pennsylvania English, I mean, there are, so many of the American dialects are already formed from contact situations, including Spanish. But um, we don't, we do not receive that information in our education. Yeah. Another, oh, another question. Okay. Another question in the chat. It says, is there any connection between what you study here and the trend for some countries to rename themselves using a non-English version of their name, for example, Turkey and India? Oh, wait. I see it here. Okay, so is there any connection between what you study here and the trend for some countries to rename themselves using a non-English version of their name, for example, Turkey? Well, I will say, great question, and I happen to have written about both of those situations. Um, Turkey going to Turkuya in India, uh, considering changing its name to Barat. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, it's hard to put them together. I'll just say that, I mean, I will invoke late modernity. Okay, here we are in late modernity, and I will invoke the political West. <laughs> okay. And in that context, language is already always political. It's like it's you know it's it, you cannot escape political configurations of of language. Um, you know when I wrote the book with Julie Taitel, you know we were imagining places and times in which you know people didn't even name their languages, um, or in which there was not a political conception of language. And those situations may still exist in certain parts of the world, but. Now we are in a moment in which language is always linked to polities and to spaces and nations and to political formations and political identities and national identities and so forth. And so, I mean, I'm just be, I'm kind of cheating the answer to this question by saying that um, that it's all it's all related via politics, I think. And that relates to your question too. Why is there an interest? Because there's this would not be that interesting if it weren't for politics, if it weren't for the Cuban Revolution, if it weren't for the Trump era, if it weren't for all of these things that have happened in recent memory in order that people take interest in a topic like, I mean, we could say it's banal. I'm not going to say that because I mean, it's, it's my research, but we could say it's banal because as a matter of fact, this is where all dialects come from through contact situations or isolate. Where does a dialect come from? Either this group goes over here and they're isolated over a long period of time and their speech is isolated and it becomes distinctive. Or they come into contact with someone else, and there's, <laughs> right? That's it. It's contact or isolation. So, um, all of the dialects of all of the languages and all of the languages themselves have come about from people moving, going about their lives, moving around the world, either isolating from other people or coming in contact with other people. So that's the story of human language, and this story is no different. So in that sense, it's like super banal, <laughs> um, super regular, but it's of interest because of the politics of it. 
Yeah. No, I. Well, no, thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. No, I, I was just going to comment on that exactly that it's, we, we know that language works that way, but the perception that no, language is static and it lives in books. And when you teach it, you have to teach the right version of it. That all, all of a sudden, when research like this comes out in such a clear view, People are shocked because, oh my God, it has already happened. What we are, <laughs> what we, what we've been trying to avoid for, you know, with a wall, with ideology, with racism, with xenophobia, it's already even in our language. So yeah. I think it's pretty shocking. And when it made the the front page of the New York Times, I read it with much interest, and I was so rejoiced because I've heard many and. Other from my daughters who live in Massachusetts and who you've got like it, to come down from the car uh, or or what do they, they say in English you say yes I'm coming they say oh yes I'm going right Go, boy in Espanol um, so there are many things that of course we notice because we are immersed in how language works but for people who think that no you know languages are tied to nationalities, uh -huh. flags, ideologies. This is inconceivable. And right. I think that it's great that it's had such visibility. And I, you know, I, I thank you because you've made it so much fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. And it, it, um, it remind yes, I mean, I was saying before about, I think about this epistemologically and the idea, you know, imagine going to, imagine, you know, you hear your grandmother speaking Vietnamese at home, it, or you hear your mother saying, get down from the car, or you hear your sibling speaking African-American English, right? So there's all this linguistic diversity inside the United States, both with multilingualism and the way that we speak non-standard varieties of English. And yet you go to school and you hear a very singular, very um, linear, trajectory of English arrives and then it fans across the continent and arrives to California and then everybody speaks English uh, thereafter. And it is, it does, it, it does not correspond with people's lived experiences. They know it's a lie. They know that it is false. And so I think that when, you know, when the, when this type of stuff comes to, um, comes up in popular culture, it resonates with people for that reason because they know, wait a minute, I, it, this, Either I feel ashamed that um, the way that my family speaks or that I speak doesn't correspond to what uh, the narrative is that's given to me at school or in my community or whatever, or I know that it's bogus, no cuadra. Mm -hmm. And so they feel you know, a little bit um, seen. No, thank you, Philip, wonderful. I'm going to repeat what everybody <laughs> said. But um, also, you know, Following on this comment, we also know that part of the history of any language is institutional, institutionalization de la lengua, right? Sí. And curricularization, como dice Guadalupe Valdez. And um, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what is going to be the meaning of teaching Spanish in a few years or now in, in a country like the US or even Mexico, because we have also immigrants from all over the world, even Latin America, everybody's moving around and ev lang dialect contacts, you know, it's obvious. So I think it's an interesting question for us, practitioners, researchers, mm -hmm. even theorists, right? What is going to be, or what, what should we, how should we think about teaching Spanish? Mm -hmm. Because these children, for example, right? As you say, they go to school and they, they face a wall of a textbook that is very simplified, it's Spanish prescriptive or whatever they decide to put there and then this doesn't make any sense to yeah. what their language practice is. But still is the language of an institution mm -hmm. and the books or the textbook, the grades, um, comes down to their identity. So we were creating there a very you know tough gap to close but I think that with talks like this and research all over the country about this, it's, it's a time for us 
to think about what is the meaning of teaching Spanish. Yeah. What is Spanish? Yeah, right? no, in, thank in you for those comments. Um, uh, Miami is such a frustrating place to have that conversation because um, it's a place where, you know, the majority of the students are learning Spanish in the home and they're learning a variety of Caribbean Spanish in the home. And yet when they go to school, it's called foreign language. You know, they have extended foreign language and um, there's no bilingual education to speak of. I think we have five dual language immersion schools out of, you know, 200 and some schools. Um, and it, uh, and the Spanish that's taught, sin ofender a nadie, eh? but, they're, but they're, they're like, they're maps of Spain in the classroom, you know, and there's like, but like, these kids are Cuban. These kids are like, you know, Caribbean. And the textbook, it might as well be the same curriculum. In fact, it is the same curriculum as in Kansas. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, and it's like, that is the institutionalization that you're talking about, but it's also by design. It's like people who are in positions of power could change that, but they don't want to change that because they want to reproduce that system. And I think that's why when kids who go through Miami-Dade County Public Schools get to FIU, they detest the very notion of Spanish in institutional settings. Um, because it's like such BS for them, frankly, um, to have gone through a system that like is absolutely like um, ignorant of their experiences or like deliberately turning a blind eye to their experiences um, and their family histories. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a problem. Yes. I just really want to like emphasize that that I definitely felt that growing up. Um, I also was in Dade County. I went to technically a public school. And the uh, my parents are Colombian, but I lived in Hialeah. Hialeah majority of population is Cuban. So in all of my Spanish classes, my own teacher was Cuban. And when I t was taking AP Spanish language, she was telling us like, this class is a joke to you all. And I expect all of you to get a five because you all know Spanish. So all I'm going to teach you is how to write Spanish correctly. So she would teach us like, what the unit is instructed on how to write a correct email, how to write a correct letter. Um, and a lot of us would do like record our little audios and turn it in as our homework assignments, expressing phrases that we grew up saying, like Caribbean phrases, Colombian phrases. And she would be like, no, 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 no. We need to be saying this. You need to be saying these words. Um, and then our literature, AP Spanish literature class was very intensive with readings from Spain and what I would consider like older Spanish to me. Um, and when I came here, I had to take the language placement exam. Mm -hmm. I got a perfect score in Spanish. So my um, first year advisor told me, why don't you think about taking a Spanish class here at a higher level? And I immediately went, why would I do that? I already took AP Spanish literature. I went through all of that. Why would I want to do that when I already know the Spanish that I need? Um, so I do really relate mm -hmm. with that, and I've seen it with among my peers as well. Did yeah. I did take a class with Adriana, and it was amazing. <laughs> it wasn't a literature-focused class, though. <laughs> but it's Spanish um, in Latin America, or for public health in Latin America. And these are classes that I don't think many of my friends in Miami are being offered, or that's what they see in their schools. So I do really appreciate that opportunity here. Thank you. Thank you. And experience. Thank you. Can I just ask a last question? Sure. Look into the future. Do you think this Miami variety will spread to the the rest the, uh, other territories in, in in Florida because of the weight of Miami in mm -hmm. Florida? I think um, to the question earlier, I think more non Latinxes will likely start to pick this up because when you look at the numbers the demographic figures in the neighborhoods, it's, it's becoming more Latinized still. So Miami-Dade County and Miami City are becoming, you know, it's already 65, 70% and 80% respectively, but it's still getting more uh, Latinized. So I think that um, uh, Anglo, Anglo whites are now less than 10%. I think those kids are probably gonna start picking this up. And I should say, I usually say this from the outset, and I always say this in my uh, press interviews, there are many ways of speaking English in Miami, not only this way, um, and the longest continuously spoken variety of English in South Florida and Miami is black English. So the uh, descendants of slaves 
who met with uh, Afro-Caribbeans, English-speaking Afro-Caribbeans in Miami, who created what I think is probably un likely a unique variety of African-American English. African-Americans have not left. Anglo-whites left. African-Americans have been there 15%, 18% since the Cuban Revolution and remain there. And so that variety of English has been ongoing. And so I, I just want that to be in the record and in the conversation that black English is an important part of the sociolinguistic English scene of South Florida. And um, I don't know. Now, the, the, the Miami-Dade Black uh, Council, which is a non-elected advisory board, does say that they push for their kids to have access to bilingual education to, to, in Spanish because they recognize that that's important. But that's not about the dialect. Um, I'm just, I'm just musing as to whether or not African Americans would learn these features. I think probably not, given the segregation of the communities. But um, yeah, I, I don't see it really going outside of, of Miami-Dade County, maybe, maybe Broward, depending on how things uh, progress. But there will be, there ha as I said, from the beginning, <laughs> through the present and into the future, Spanish will be shaping the way people speak English in the United States. Well, thank you very much. This has been so enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.